Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from OnlinePhotographyTraining.com. Welcome to my video series, Mastering Lightroom Classic CC. In this video, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the import process in Lightroom. Now, as you can see, I have my desktop here, and on my desktop, you can see that I have a memory card plugged into my computer. Also, I have Lightroom open. And I did mention in the last video that if you want to import images and you're in the library module, it's very easy to summon the import dialog box because there's a button over here at the bottom of the left-hand panel. If you're in any of the other modules, that button will not be there. And then you'll have to go up to the File menu, then down to Import Photos and Video. And you can see to the right of that and to the right of many of the other menu uh, uh, items, there is a keyboard shortcut, Shift-Command-I. That's because I have a Mac. If you have a PC, it's Shift-Control-I. And keyboard shortcuts do make life considerably easier in Lightroom. So I encourage you to go over to my website and download my Lightroom keyboard shortcut cheat sheet. Uh, there's hundreds of keyboard shortcuts in Lightroom, and I think you'll find that cheat sheet invaluable. So I want to summon the import dialog box. So I'm just going to click on that, and you could see it will immediately opens up. Now, there is a chance that your import dialog box will not look like mine. If that's the case, look over here in the lower left-hand corner. You can see there's a little square with an upward facing triangle. If I click on that, it minimizes the box and the import uh, box now just has the essential information that Lightroom will need to import your images. Typically, most of us don't use this smaller import dialog. We use the larger one. So if you're seeing this, go over to the left hand corner and you can see that box is there with a downward facing triangle this time. Click on that box and it will open up into the larger import dialog. Now, if you have your camera plugged into your computer or a memory card, Lightroom should have found the images automatically and Lightroom would be displaying them as it is on my computer here. If you do not have a memory card or your camera plugged in, Lightroom may not be able to find the images, especially if they're on the internal hard drive or an external hard drive or something like that. If that's the case, you're going to have to navigate to where those images are. Now, for the sake of this demonstration, if we look over at the left-hand panel, you can see that it found my memory card. It's a Nikon D850 XQD card, so it's showing it right away. But let's just say that, plug, that card wasn't plugged in. Well, you could look down here and it shows the various hard drives associated with the computer. I have the internal Macintosh drive, and then I have four external hard drives plugged in then it has that memory card. If that memory card isn't plugged in, that wouldn't be there. But let's just say I have some images on this hard drive called Morganti Drive. I would hit this little triangle that is called an expose triangle. And once my drive wakes up because it went to sleep, you'll see all the folders that are on that drive. And then from this point, I could drill down to where the images are. And I have a folder called Instagram Pictures. And I could either double click on it to open the folder or hit the expose triangle again to show more folders that are under that folder. But I could just click on it once, really. I don't have to double click on it. And it will display all the images that are in that folder. Now, in this case, these are images that are on that external hard drive. This may happen sometimes. You may have images on a hard drive and you want to load them into Lightroom. Well, once you do that and you found them, you could look at them and you could see they all have check marks on them. So they're ready to import into Lightroom. We're looking at what is called the grid view. If you want to look at an individual image, you could go down here in the lower left-hand corner. You could see there's two boxes. This box right here is for looking at a single image. We'll click on that and we're on a single image. Now you could view them in this larger format and you may call them from here. Like if you want to import this one, just use your arrow keys to go through all the images. I'll use my right arrow key to go to the next image, the right arrow key, the next image. 
right arrow key the next image. And let's say I do not want to import this one. I could just click this little checkbox off and then I won't be importing that. If I want to go back to the grid view, I could go back over here and click this little box again and I'm back into the grid view. Now, the keyboard shortcut for these two different views is G for grid view and E for that single image view. So if I hit the E key on my keyboard, I have the single image. If I hit G, I'm back to grid view. And then you can see this one image right here, I turned it off, I unchecked it. So that image would not be imported into the Lightroom library. Now, when you import, there's several different ways you could import the image. Technically, there's four different ways. If we go up here and look at the top, we see we have copy as DNG, copy, move, and add. Copy as DNG will take your original file wherever it is, if it's on a memory card or if it's on um, an external hard drive or if, even if it's on your local drive, and it will convert it to a DNG file. DNG stands for digital negative, and it is Adobe's version of a RAW file. Um, it's open source, and I think Adobe, when they created it, they were hoping that all camera manufacturers would use this single open source format for raw files and we'd have some continuity from between all the brands as far as their raw files were concerned. Well, unfortunately, all the manufacturers decided to make their own proprietary raw files. So you would have to, if you want to use a DNG file, you, you could convert it when you import it. Now, the advantage of using a DNG file is it tends to be smaller than the manufacturer's raw file and it tends to render a little quicker in the computer. The disadvantages of it are that if you have your computer set up to write the edits, typically, well, I should back up a little bit, when you edit an image in Lightroom, the, because Lightroom is non-destructive, the edits get written to the Lightroom catalog. They're stored there. There is an option in Lightroom, and we'll talk about it in a future episode, where you could also have Lightroom write those edits to an external sidecar file, they call it. So if your raw file is in a specific folder, the edits will be written to the Lightroom catalog and to an external file that will be in the same folder as the original image. They call that a sidecar file. If you're using DNG raw files, that sidecar file is not created. Instead, the edits are written directly to the DNG file. And a lot of people do not like that. Even though it's still non-destructive, you could still go back through all your steps and undo what you did. Because you're writing to the original raw file, there is a chance that that file could be corrupted. Usually files are corrupted during write operations. So if you have the most valuable picture in the world, you took a picture of Bigfoot, and you're editing it, and you have it set up so the edits are written as a sidecar file, but you're using a DNG raw file, those edits will be written directly to that DNG file. And if for some reason you have a glitch in your computer or your computer shuts off in mid-write, you could corrupt that file and lose that Bigfoot pic picture forever. So a lot of people don't like DNG files just for that reason. Nowadays, everything is very reliable, and you tend not to have computers crashing during mid-writes. Or even if they do, they tend not to damage the files. So it's up to you whether you want to use DNG. As I did say, it does seem to render a little quicker, and it does take up less disk space. The other option you have is just to copy them as is. So you're going to copy the files exactly as they are. They're going to keep the same name and everything, usually, unless you rename them. But they're the same file. They're the same raw file. The other two options are move and add. If I have these, as I have these on this Morganti hard drive, they're in the folder Instagram pictures. If I move them, then it will take them out of that folder and put them in whatever folder I tell it to go into over here on the right-hand panel. We'll get to that in a minute. So you're actually moving them. 
The other option is add. If you choose this add option, the pictures will stay exactly where they are. You're just going to add them to the Lightroom library. So when you open Lightroom and go to edit one of those images, Lightroom is going to look to this Morganti drive, to this folder to find the image. So there's these four different choices, but sometimes you'll only be able to do two of the four choices. And that is when you're using a memory card or you have your computer plugged into your computer or you have your, you have your camera plugged into your computer. If that is the case, and that is the case here, I have a memory card plugged into my computer, the move and add functions are not applicable. So I either could copy them as they are, and these happen to be Nikon RAW files, or I could copy them as a DNG file. I don't use DNG files, I use my original RAW files, so I would choose copy. So that is that. Hopefully that made sense. So after we choose how we're going to get them into Lightroom, either as a DNG file, a straight copy, or in some cases, we're moving them from one folder to another, or we're just adding them into Lightroom. Once we decide that, as we look at them, there's different ways we could view them in this middle part. All photos, meaning we're going to look at every single photo that is in that location. In this case, it's this memory card. New photos. If I imported images into Lightroom and I left them on the memory card, then took new images, if I click this little box here, then only the new images would be displayed. The last choice is destination folders. If I took pictures over a number of days and had them all on the memory card and then put that memory card and opened up this import dialog and clicked this destination folders, then each day basically would be shown here. As you can see now, it's showing May 10th, 2018. I took these pictures this morning. If I took pictures yesterday, we'd have another group of pictures saying May 9th, 2018. If I took pictures two days ago, we'd have a third group saying May 8th, 2018. So that's just how they're displayed in this middle part. Typically, you just leave them on all photos. You could cull them here, as I mentioned. So you could either double click on one to bring it into this view and then include or exclude it in import by going there. You could, of course, use the keyboard shortcut as E, E as in Edward, to go into this view, hit G to go to the grid view. You could change the size of these images with this slider over here. So you're making the thumbnails bigger or smaller to help you see them a little better and get an idea whether or not you want to import all of them. And the sort, I have it by default sorted to capture time. So I took this image first and this image last. You also could do it by the this the check say state so if i have one unchecked it'll go toward the end or the, the unchecked ones will be at the end and the other is the file name so in alphabetical order if you want to flip it you'd click right here and you'd go from a to z to z to a uh, the file type in this case they're all nikon raw files so they're going to be the same but if you had various raw uh, different types of files here they'd be sorted by file type. Media type, they're all Nikon RAW files. If you had some uh, video files in here, they'd be uh, in their own group. So like I said, I usually keep that on capture time. So that's really how you kind of find your images, then organize your images to view them in the middle part. Now, the real meat and potatoes of the import dialog box is over here on the right-hand panel. At the very, very top, you could see there's this thing here. It says two photos from this drive or some. It's like confusing. But if you click on it, what that is, it's kind of like shortcuts to popular places on your computer. I could import these photos to my desktop, pictures, or movies folders very easily by clicking here. Or we could go to another destination and actually... Um, if I do that, and because I have a Mac, Mac Finder opens up and I could drill down to where I want them to go. If you have a PC, of course, Windows File Explorer will open up and you could go and pick the folder you want to send these images to. 
Usually, we don't use this top part unless you're really in a hurry and you want to just like send them to your desktop or to your pictures or movies folders. Usually, what we'll do is we'll do that down here where it says destination. So we'll get to that in a minute. The real thing, though, is all the different things you could do to the image as you're importing it, starting at the top. When you're importing it, it's going to ask you at the top here, what kind of preview do you want to build? And I did touch on this in the last video. There's four different previews, minimal, embedded in sidecar, standard, and one-to-one. -one. The minimal previews take up the least amount of space on your computer. The one-to-one -one previews take up the most. So they get from very little space on your computer, a little more space, a little more space, to the most space. But the minimal previews will take longer to render as you go from image to image as you have the images in, imported and you have the film strip along the bottom of your computer and you use the arrow keys or you click on an image to view it, it takes a second or two to, to um, render. And if you have minimal previews, it takes a little longer for them to render because the minimal preview isn't of high enough resolution for you to view it in the middle part here. So it takes a little longer for for Lightroom to build an acceptable preview so you could view it. Embedded in Sidecar is a little bit bigger and the um, it actually has two previews. One is embedded in the RAW file and another one is a Sidecar file. Um, I don't know anyone that uses that, that option. That will render a little faster. Standard is usually what I use. The previews are a little larger. They take up a little more disk space but they render a little bit quicker. And when I say render slow or renders fast, we're not talking about minutes here. We're talking about less than five seconds. So it's a minor inconvenience if you're using minimal previews for them to render. On most computers, they'll render very quickly. Where you may run into an issue is if your computer has less than 12 gigabytes of RAM. Adobe recommends that any computer running Lightroom have at least 12 gigabytes of RAM. And where, you're, well, where you will see that issue is with your previews when they render. If you don't have a large enough uh, RAM installed or enough RAM installed on your computer, it will render slower. This iMac I work on has 32 gigabytes of RAM. My MacBook has 16 gigabytes of RAM, and they both render fine. The last one is one-to-one -one previews. These are the most resolute of the previews. They render the quickest, but they take up the most disk space. So use whichever preview works for you. Below that, we have a checkbox, Build Smart Previews. If you have it, your images stored on an external hard drive like I do, I have all my Lightroom images on an external hard drive. If you unplug that hard drive and open up Lightroom, you will not be able to work on the images. The hard drive has to be turned on, plugged in, loaded, uh, ready to go. Otherwise, you won't be able to work on an image unless you build a smart preview. Smart previews allow you to process an image without the image being present. So you could do that if you often use, this come more in common if you uh, have a laptop or a MacBook or something and you have all your images on an external hard drive, but you often just grab the computer, you're at a coffee shop or something, you don't feel like plugging in the external hard drive, you could just then process images. The problem is, or the thing is, that smart previews do take up the most disk, disk space because they're really an image. They're pretty big. So keep that in mind. You may not want to have all your images be smart previews, only those you know you're going to be processing in the future without the hard drive being plugged in. Below that, we have don't import suspected duplicates. If this is checked, if an image if Lightroom thinks an image was already imported, it would be grayed out and the checkbox would be turned off. Just like that. And then if you go to new photos up here, that will not show. But because it's showing now because this image is not is a new photo, even though I'm not checking it. So that is what don't import suspect duplicates do. You could back up your images as you import them. You could make a second copy to somewhere else on your system. So you would check this box, click this little expose triangle over here, and then you could choose a folder. And again, Mac Finder or Windows File Explorer will pop up. You could pick a folder on your computer, and then Lightroom will 
import the image to where you want it to go and make a copy of that import and put it where you want it to go. Below that is Add to Collection. We're going to have a video in the future where we talk about collections in Lightroom. Collections are a great feature of Lightroom. Typically, all your images are on folders, and the folders are discrete, meaning they're actually on your hard drive. You could go outside of Lightroom, use File Explorer or something, and find that folder, and that whole hierarchy will be present on your hard drive. A collection is virtual. Let's say that you went to 20 different zoos last year, and you have thousands of images, but you have like um, hundreds of images of polar bears, and they're all across all these different zoo folders you have. Well, you could make a collection that just contains the polar bears, and then you could easily go to that collection, view all your polar bear images in one place. It doesn't take any up any more disk space. It's a virtual place where images reside. And you could do that right when you're importing. So I could import these to a specific collection if I wanted to. When I click the box, I could send it to what is inherent in Lightroom is a, is a quick collection. I could do that. That's in everyone's Lightroom. Or I could click this little plus sign and create a new collection. And we're going to get into collections into some detail in a future video. Below that is file renaming. You may want to rename the files. You may not want to use the original file name. If that's the case, you could click there, and there's a couple different templates. There's several different templates you could use. Click on the drop down, and you could see there's a custom name, X of Y. So if I call these um, like uh, Museum One of Two, One of or Two of Two, something like that, that's how they would get named. Original file number, custom name with the original file number, custom name, sequence, all these. So you could come in here and pick one of these. And then it gives you an example of what it will look like here. Um, so you could do any of these if you prefer. Then it might, some of them might ask you to give it a word, like a name. Like that's, you were using short name, original file number. Uh, so you would add it there. You could edit these if you want to. Go to this drop down, go to edit. And you could see we have shoot name, not short name, shoot name file number suffix. If I want to get rid of these, let's say I want to get rid of file number suffix, I would click on that and I could just hit the delete key. So I got that out of there. And then I could add something to it. Um, maybe I want to add the date. So I could just go to this drop down. What format of date do I want to use? Year, month, and day. And it gets added to that. So I could put short name, the, the shoot name. This is, you know, the Buffalo History Museum shoot and the date of it. Um, then once I'm done, I could click done and it's going to be an edited uh, version of that template. Or I could click here and go down to save current settings as a new preset. Click on that, give it a name. I'll give it a name demo and click create and then click done. Now, when I go to the drop down, you could see demo is there. So I could click on any of these and include a demo, and demo is the way we had it. Um, if you want to get rid of this, go down to edit. We're on demo. Go to the drop down, delete preset demo. Click on that. It's going to ask you, you sure you want to do that? Click delete, and then click done. Now, that drop down demo is gone. You may have screwed these up. Maybe you edited them and changed them around and you wouldn't want to get back to their original versions. Click to edit again, go to this drop down again, and then go down to restore default presets. Click on that and then click done and you'll have your default presets the way they were set up when you originally uh, used Lightroom, just like that. So there's a lot of different ways you could rename the files. Renaming files is could help you find them later. A lot of times it's hard to find a file when it's underscore DSC 14771 or something, whatever, dot NEF. It's hard to find that because you're not really sure what it is. So you could rename these to something that you'd remember and easily find. There's a lot of good search functionality in Lightroom, and we're going to be covering that in a future video, how you could search for images, and renaming could help. Now, I mentioned in the previous video that there's two different types of presets you could apply to your image 
as you're importing it. One of those is a develop preset. Those are just the pre uh, presets that come with Lightroom or those you might buy from a third party that when you, uh, as you're importing the image into Lightroom, it'll apply that processing preset to your image. The other type of preset is a metadata preset. In my case, I've, I have an import preset that I created, and I will show how to do this in a future video. That import preset puts my name, my address, my contact info, my copyright info, and my rights info, or what I own the image, basically. So that all gets added to the added to the metadata as my image is being imported. And I strongly suggest you create an import preset of your own. And again, I will be showing that in a future video. It's not done. Creating the import preset isn't done in this screen. It's done somewhere else. Now, keywords. I strongly suggest, this is where I screwed up when I first started using Lightroom. <clears throat> I strongly suggest that you add keywords to your image. It makes it so much easier to search for images when you have pertinent keywords for your image. If you don't have a collection of polar bears and you have them all in those 20 different zoo locations and maybe you went to more, more the zoo more than once and you have all these subfolders of dates and all this other stuff, but if you had put in the keyword polar bear, you'd be able, easy to find all your polar bear images. So in this case here, this is um, buffalo. Then put a comma. So put separate your keywords by comma. Then I go, this is a history museum. I could put in, this is um, cherry blossoms. Then I like putting my copyright and my name in there also, even though that is being added to the metadata already with my import preset. I like to put it as a keyword as well. So with a Mac, it's easy to get the copyright symbol. You just hold in the option key and hit the G key and you'll get the copyright symbol. And you can see it's defaulting to my name because I've done this before. So then you could just, you know, hit tab and it's in there. Uh, with a PC, I'm not sure how you get that copyright symbol, but if somebody could write in the comments below this video how you do it, I'm sure everyone would appreciate that. So just click enter like that. And then you have the keywords now and all those will get added to every image as they're being imported. Now the big part is destination. Where are we gonna put these things? Well, this is where I screwed up too. Um, I have them going into the location folder and inside of that location folder, I have a subfolder of date. I found it very difficult now that I have like 60, 70,000 images in my Lightroom to find a very specific image. Often I get somebody calling me and they want to purchase a very specific image. And I don't remember where I put it and I didn't really put good keywords in when I imported it. So I, it takes me a long time to find the image. So what I would suggest you do is sit down, get a piece of paper, figure out how you would need to find images in the future. And then try to set up a file system that will allow you to do that. I would encourage to anyone watching this video, if you have a great way to import and sort images, in the comments below, tell us how you do it. Um, like I mentioned, I do it by location. In this case, the location was the Buffalo History Museum. It would be Buffalo History Museum and then today's date. Well, that kind of stinks. Like I said, there might be a better way. If you're a wedding photographer, I think the best way is you put the uh, couple's name, the wedding name. So you just photograph the Wilson family. So you have Wilson. You might want to have the date. Or you might want to rename the images with the date included in the name. So you know what date they were taken. Um, so that maybe is a way you'd want to do it. A portrait photographer may do it that way also. They're doing the Smith family. Uh, something like that. But there's all different. Wildlife photographer, if you're out you know, um, shooting lions, you may prefer... The, you know, all your lions to be in one category, something like that. So I encourage anyone that has a great way to do it, post it below because I really need to get better at the way I'm sorting and um, filing my images. So for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to keep doing it um, this way. So I'm going to put them into the subfolder Buffalo History, and I should probably call it Museum. 
Oh, I have a museum there. Okay. So Buffalo History Museum. And then I'm going to organize them by date after that. So you can see down here, it's going into the photos hard drive. That's where I'm storing these images. If I wanted to put them on, let's say, the um, media, no, let's say that Morganti drive again. If I wanted to put them there and I wanted to put it in books, then they would go there. You could see it has Buffalo History Museum and then a subfolder with the date. So right here, you find where you want to put them. I have on my photos external hard drive. I have one folder that says raw files. I want it to go into that raw files folder and it's going to go there in a, a subfolder called Buffalo History Museum. See it's written there and then a subfolder of that with the date 2018 May 10th. Just like that. That's the way I always do it and I found that it doesn't work that great but for the sake of this demonstration, you get an idea how this little um, part of the import process works. A lot of people like to not use this, meaning they won't have Lightroom open. They use Windows File Explorer or Mac Finder to create folders. Then they just drag their images off their memory card or off their computer or off their um, camera, I'm sorry into that folder then they use the add function up here to add them into Lightroom. That's the way I actually I used to do it a lot do it a long time ago. Do whichever way works best for you but once you have this now um, really we're done. So we have them going into the raw files folder and they're going to go into the Buffalo History Museum subfolder and into the May 10th 2018 subfolder of that. So that's the file hierarchy. So we're satisfied, just click import. Now, once you click import, you, by default, Lightroom is going to go up here on the left, when you're in the library module, if you look at the catalog section over here in the left-hand panel, you're going to go to the current import folder. It's not really a folder, it's like a location. So you're going to go there and it's going to then add the fold the images. It's going to copy them from the memory card, add the metadata I want it to add, and add the keywords I want it to add. I'm not renaming them or anything like that. And it's putting them in that folder on the hard drive. So if I go over to this photos external drive and I open up this Buffalo History Museum subfolder, and then I now these are temp as it's importing, those will go away. Lightroom is just using those to hold the images. But you can see here, the images are going in. They're getting added as we go into this folder, just like that. So they're getting put into this folder, and we're in grid view. We're in the library module. If you want to go and look at a single image, you could just like double click on the image, and you'll view the image. Or again, you could use those keyboard shortcuts, G, to go to the grid view or E to go to that single image view. So you could easily pop out. Also, those two icons are still here in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. So you could go to the single view there, grid view there. So that's them importing. Once the import process is totally done, your computer will sound. Then it will create the previews. While it's creating the previews, even while it was importing, I could start processing an image. I don't have to wait. So, um, you know, I could go in into the develop module and start processing an image and then it creates previews. And some computers will be slower creating the previews. The smaller previews, of course, go really fast. The one-to-one -one previews will take a little more time. The smart previews will take a lot more time. So you could come in and you could, like, you know, pick an image you want to process. And then you could go over to the develop module and start processing. Now, that's the import process. Once you get them in here, you should cull them. You should get rid of the crappy ones, the ones that, you know, you messed up exposure or they're crooked or whatever. You know, someone photobombed them and you want to get rid of it. Or, and you should prioritize the better ones, the ones you want to process right away, the ones you think you're going to be able to sell or, or share, or whatever you want to do with them. And that's going to be our next video. 
I'm going to give you a lot of tips and techniques on how to cull your images and compare images to see which one is the best out of two, three, four images. So look for that in our next video. Thank you everyone that watches my videos. I truly do appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon.